are ready on the back end. Uh, so Heather will be joining us now. Once Welcome. again, she's presenting automotive security standards are special, just like every other industry. Hi, Heather. Welcome, Heather. Hi, thanks hey. for having me. Yeah, we see you and hear you. Excellent, thank you. Fantastic. Say, do I have slides? Should have slides. Also fantastic. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for uh, dialing into my talk um, about how automotive security standards are special, special snowflakes, just like every other industry. Um, so first, a little bit of background. Uh, me, I know the host did a great job of introducing me. Um, I do have a bachelor's in computer science from a school out in Ohio, as well as a master's also from a school out in Ohio. Um, and I've been in the, in the industry 15 years. That's hard to believe already. Um, I kind of grew up in the Department of Defense um, before I trucked out west here to Seattle um, and bounced around from e-commerce to big data, um, even into the insurance space. I was uh, effectively the CISO um, for an insurance broker for a little while. And now I'm uh, here at PACCAR looking at the embedded space. Um, and then I also work with uh, small businesses to make sure that they have the security that they need as a small business um, and make sure that they don't get ransomware or hacked because that uh, is definitely an area that needs attention. Um, have a handful of certifications like you would expect, the CISSP, GCIH, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not one for over amounts of uh, acronyms after my name, but such a such as it is. So I kind of wanted to start by uh, the state of things as it is. Uh, we're kind of in a good news, bad news situation here. Um, the good news is that uh, ever since the GPAC in 2015 kind of exploded uh, onto the scene with that big Wired article, um, it's definitely improved. Um, we've had some research done uh, prior, uh, some as early as, early as uh, 2010, but it didn't get a whole lot of traction, especially not in the public uh, space. Because um, the assumption was that we had to have physical access to the vehicles, it was slow, it couldn't scale, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and we are making forward progress in things like secure onboard communications, because we've got a, a draft standard uh, coming in J193991C, and we have our hardware security modules are becoming more and more common, as well as security gateways and vehicle uh, network architectures and the network, uh, network segmentation. Unfortunately, um, it's still kind of not great. Um, vehicles are definitely part of critical infrastructure. Uh, life, especially here in North America, depends on uh, commercial trucking. It moves two thirds of uh, goods in North America alone, and that's just one continent. Um, and then our great American dream is also fairly car dependent in ways that Europe isn't. Um, and then when it comes to things like eating delicious food, that food's got to be grown and serviced by those agricultural vehicles. Um, so those are pretty, uh, pretty critical to life as we know it here. So that makes vehicles a high value target now for uh, bad actors. And it, this is an area of security that's still very much in its, I say, toddlerhood. We're not quite infants, but we're definitely toddling around and uh, cruising. Um, so it's a bit like trying to move a mountain. It's hard, it's difficult, and nobody can do it alone. So here we are. So first, I'm going to talk about the problem space here as, uh, as I see it. Uh, um, can't do a standards talk without uh, an obligatory XKCD comment. Uh, if anybody's ever tried to have a universal remote and still ended up with four other remotes, I feel you. Uh, I've definitely confused my parents with uh, the home setup uh, at home. Uh, so hopefully uh, on the slide are some familiar acronyms, NIST, ISO, PCI, HIPAA, uh, CIS. The ones that may be a little less familiar are NYDFS, the New York Department of Financial Services, which effectively covers the security of the, inf of the insurance industry, and NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation covering the electric grid. Um, and this is just a handful of certs, uh, regulations and frameworks, and 
because they're proliferating at sort of a rapid rate, it's really difficult to know which ones apply to any given industry or organization and which ones don't. Um, Because these are increasingly finding their way into smaller and smaller businesses. Uh, For example, if you are a uh, interpreting translation firm and you provide services to help um, Hispanic folks don't speak a whole lot of English, they still have to go to the doctor and you provide that interpretation, uh, that's great. Only now that's medical data. And as hospitals have gotten more and more ransomware, um, they're looking more at their security and they're diving into their third parties, their interpreters. And it's like, I don't know, I just interpret languages. Like, I don't know anything about security. So they are finding their way down in to those businesses. And you would think that something like phrase New York Department of Financial Services would only cover the New York-based businesses, but that's not actually the case because it covers any insurance agents that have licenses to sell insurance in the state of New York, which, as it turns out, includes all the national businesses as well. So even though the uh, brokerage I worked for uh, is based out here in Washington, uh, it was a national uh, national organization. They sold had clients all over, so there was license to sell in New York. So we had to follow that. And there, these frameworks have plenty, plenty, plenty in common. Oh, uh, there we go. Sorry, as I flip through my slides here, remember where I put stuff. Um, They have plenty in common um, from incident response to risk management programs and policies, um, but they also differ uh, plenty as well because each one of these has their own lens in which they uh, see the world. And each one of those is going to provide uh, sort of that path forward because as the regulations come in, that's going to have an effect on the security of these uh, industry verticals uh, and how the security evolves for better or for worse. Uh, so the fine folks over at Audit Scripts have put in tons of hours to normalize, cross check, uh, categorize the different security uh, frameworks and different control sets. And this is meant to be a little bit of a zoomed out eye chart. Um, just to show like the breadth of what the spreadsheet kind of looks like, um, there are 35 different standards and versions of those standards that uh, they've tracked. And like I said, each one's got strengths and weaknesses depending on how they see the world. Because ISO 27000, it's really, really strong in security operations uh, and secure code development, but it doesn't have a whole lot in network device and uh, boundary protection controls. And 35 is a lot of standards, um, and that's not even all of them because it's just the ones that are captured here. So the result has been different security baselines across the different uh, now interconnected industries and industry verticals. We've got the supply chain attacks, and now all of these industries are trying to come together and make sure that they're secured sort of across the board. If you're a small supplier to a bigger organization, you may have less onerous security requirements reflecting your smaller size because it makes a difference if you're a private practice with 10 uh, employees versus a huge hospital network. Um, it makes a difference in the amount of resources that you have, not that they have tons of resources there anyway. And you may find yourself, oh, the small supplier is not subject to the regulation that the big corporations are as well, which is all well and good until it's not. Um, Because this kind of results in what I call the divorce child problem, like you're playing mom off dad to kind of get what you want, right? So we're not the Department of Defense. We're the Department of Justice. So we don't have to follow this regulation. Uh, We're not part of the intel community. We're the Department of Defense. Oh, we're not, uh, uh, and then, yeah, we're not part of the intel community, and we're Department of Defense, and then that reverse, if I can get the words in order here. So basically playing one off the other in an attempt to get out of doing the work, uh, because security work costs money. We actually have to put resources towards it. one I've run into more recently is we're not the OEM, so the regulation doesn't apply. <laughs> All right, great, uh, except that the OEMs need the need help in order to comply with the regulation from all of our, their suppliers. 
So there's all has been different baselines, different levels of uh, minimum level of security. And that's kind of affecting the supply chain at this point. Um, and like I said, all of these have common, common themes, uh, things like have policy, have access control, turn on MFA, train your people, um, have some logs, uh, do some auditing, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, these are broadly applicable across all the different industry verticals and across uh, regulation jurisdictions, because we also have cases where maybe the federal government is trying to uh, pass all of these cybersecurity regulations, and maybe that's not the way it's supposed to be done. Maybe it does have to come from the states, uh, the state level. Um, it's like, I'm not here to argue whose jurisdiction it is. Uh, I just want stuff to be secure. Um, and then what's not on, uh, what I didn't include on the slide here is the areas of incident response and third party risk management, because those are gaining lots and lots of traction um, because again, supply chain. So as part of my work, I did take, uh, I took that fine, fine spreadsheet and I uh, added on a couple of columns for uh, ISO 21434, the vehicle security standards, as well as UNECE 155156, which are the uh, European regulations for vehicle security. Um, I really debated some of the placement of these controls, but especially because the more manufacturing esque controls, but I was eventually able to, to correlate and uh, decide where each one of those controls went in the security catalog that audit scripts have already established because they did the hard work of normalizing those 35 standards into about 400 odd control statements. Um, so that was my super set of controls. And then spoiler alert, what I did was tailor the security controls uh, to what was important for automotive. So I would be remiss if I would say that we've kind of seen some of this before because um, automotive and vehicle security is hardly the only industry vertical with this problem. Uh, John Strand did a great webinar uh, after the colonial pipeline attacks in uh, May 2021, which is somehow two years ago. Don't get that. Um, but everyone thinks they're a special security case and they want to keep their legacy systems running for years and years and years. Uh, you can't turn us off. We're mission critical. We're the mission. You can't turn us off. We can't upgrade. We can't do maintenance. We can't patch nothing. Yeah, that's not really a fantastic plan because then we keep just accepting the risk. And when it comes to product security and legacy systems, automotive is a little bit at a disadvantage because the useful life cycle of these uh, cars and of these vehicles and trailers um, is a long time. So, and patching is really hard because in order to patch, we have to uh, maybe issue a recall and get consumers to bring their cars back to the dealers. And there's going to be thousands of model, uh, cars on the road across hundreds of different models, all of which are slightly different, um, and that they're going to be on the road for decades and uh, years to come. And so we can't just say, oh, we can't do anything. It's legacy. Like, people are going to die. That, that kind of hen ringing that, oh, we've tried everything and we're all out of ideas. That's not really working out too well for any of these other areas. Um, so we have to be able to do something about it. Which brings me to act two of this talk. So I joke about secure, the vehicle security being a special, special snowflakes, but what is special about it? Um, what do we have to watch out for between going through all of the R&D manufacturing design down the uh, one side of the V, back up the other side of the V, getting things uh, into the factories, onto the production lines, getting it off the production lines, onto the road, and then eventually to the great scrap heap in the sky. Like That's a whole life cycle. So what's special about it? already talked about how it's critical infrastructure because uh, we kind of need cars. Um, we also have uh, the aspect of functional safety because obviously we want our vehicles to be safe. 
Uh, we have IT issues now because cars are becoming more and more computer-like. Uh, ask any mechanic, and you, I'm sure they will have a whole rant for that. Um, and then there's a supply chain that goes along with IT uh, and the back end systems for that. And then, of course, we have the operational technology that runs all the production lines because it's all well and good to establish critical business processes in IT and then not not cover the machine in the factory that all it does is cut the hoses. But without the machine, without that one machine, the whole line goes down like that's not great for a manufacturing uh, environment. <clears throat> Excuse me here. So the good news is that all of these areas here, they're not they're not silos. We're not having four different smokestacks around a fifth smokestack. Um, because individually, all of these areas have associated standards and best practices, um, functional safety in particular, they've got a very well established uh, process. Uh, and it's also critical to look at the actual data that we're looking at in the cars, because um, it could, the level of security we need depends on what kind of use case we, we're having. So if we take something as simple as GPS data, um, if we're looking at a, a piece of farm equipment, we've got to be able to query that. <clears throat> we've got to be able to analyze that and share that because that's how the farmers are getting the maximum yield out of the crops because they have it down to the GPS coordinates of where the seeds go and how much water it's got to have and how much fertilizer it's got to have. And all of that is uh, very uh, GPS driven these days. So it's critical that that's got to be shared. But if we take the same GPS data and now we put it in a consumer vehicle, just some, I don't know, random Chev Chevy car on the road, uh, that GPS location data, if someone's being abused in a stalker situation, uh, we don't want that data to be shared, right? Because stalking is bad. Um, so we want to be able to protect the privacy of those individuals. So it really depends on the use case. So we've got a lot of things going in here. So, and it's not enough, like I said, to treat each one of these areas as its own smokestack. We, because they combine to form something that's greater than the sum of their parts. So we have to threat model. Because this brings me to, okay, what can possibly, possibly go wrong? Um, the good news here is that the possible damage scenarios are reasonably finite. Um, the MC is for referencing all the self-driving autonomous uh, cars and the terrible sci-fi stories that goes that have gone along with that. Um, plenty of those, and we've even had some real-life examples, uh, courtesy of the Russian-Ukrainian war, because uh, that one picture with all the taxi cabs um, was causing city a citywide disruption in Moscow at the beginning of the conflict. And yes, this particular instance, it was more of a hack of the rideshare app than the vehicles themselves. But as we move into that autonomous uh, vehicle space, um, the same effect could be achieved uh, hacking those autonomous cars. And we saw the effect that had on the city because it was total gridlock. Um, and we also saw the use of a kill switch on uh, the captured uh, John Deere tractors, uh, effectively bricking $5 million worth of farm equipment so they wouldn't fall into, say, enemy hands at this point. And I'm using quotation marks as I am not an expert in the geopolitical situation there at all. Um, I'm just looking at the, the vehicle disruptions here. And these scenarios all have plenty of things in common because if we come right down to it, what do vehicles do? They go, they stop, and they steer. It's a pretty limited set of functions. So if we drive off a bridge, um, that is a stopping and steering issue. If we crash into something, that's again, stopping and steering. Um, if we use the power line uh, commands to bleed an air brake system dry, um, that's a vehicle's got to stop kind of issue because our brakes are gone. Um, the brakes being gone was also highlighted in the uh, 2015 Jeep research. And that's not to say that all vehicles are the same thing because they will have other functions. We have our dump trucks, we have our garbage trucks, we have the cement mixers, the refrigerated trucks, the crop sprayers. 
and all of those kind of bodybuilder components. But even so, that's a limited set of what the vehicles can do. So it's not as crazy sounding, like we don't have to panic, oh God, tons of things can go wrong. No, it's a very finite set. So we have that list, we have our damage scenarios, and then we can say, okay, how can those damage scenarios come about? We have, now we have threat scenarios. Uh, do we have can injection? Does it have to uh, load malicious software? Do we need physical access? Can we do it remotely? Um, and it's important to remember that damage and threat scenarios is a many to many relationship. So many threat scenarios can lead to uh, several different damage scenarios and uh, one dam and several damage scenarios can have multiple threat uh, scenarios as well. So at this point, we kind of want to look at the entire possible attack chain because maybe uh, an attack can be accomplished by loading malicious software or uh, not loading malicious software at all, but being able to do some can injection to send malicious messages. So that's where we get into the security controls that now we're designing. So we shore up those potential entry points. Um, and that's where we have to ripple it down the supply chain as well, because something as simple as only loading ma uh, authenticated software okay, is the OEM writing that software or is the OEM having a supplier write that software? So the OEM's got to trust that it's coming from the supplier um, in an authentic way. So what the supplier sends is what the OEM receives. So that's got to be uh, good. Then the OEM does stuff to push it out to the vehicles. So the connection between OEMs and the vehicles, that's got to be uh, authenticated and, and secured. And then once that software gets to the vehicles, it's uh, ways to authenticate things. It's probably going to be cryptography based, which means that the vehicles that you see use have to have a way to authenticate that, which means storing those cryptographic keys. Um, and if you look at the field of cryptography, um, even a little bit, you will very quickly discover that key management and key uh, distribution in a secure way is a is a lot harder than it sounds. So, and we have to manage that across that supply chain. So from the supplier to the OEM, and then finally down to the vehicle. All right, so now that we've looked at it, we've threat modeled, how do we tailor the standards for risk? Because remember I said, spoiler alert, earlier that I was really just taking the security frameworks that existed and tailoring them. That's what we're doing. Um, so let's get back to what are the risks? What, what, is, the, uh, what is that risk? Because uh, vehicle security, we're not in this alone. Even though we're just those little toddlers um, cruising around, um, we've got allies. Because if we go back to uh, this picture here, uh, functional safety and OT and IT, um, they can help us out here because functional safety already has processes for hazard and ha hazard analysis and risk assessment that's already baked in. Um, and those processes are going to look at the, the component and decide how safety critical it is because they've got a critical, they've got a high, they've got a medium, they've got a, they've got a low. This component isn't safety critical at all. But, and if we look at it, the components that are going to be safety critical are probably also going to be uh, critical to uh, security as well, because a lot of times, not always, I don't want to make blanket statements here, um, if an ECU is critical to the safe operation of the vehicle, um, then we want to make sure it's secured uh, as well, because we're back to that uh, core functionality of going, stopping, and steering. Because what a uh, horror won't cover is that malicious attacker because that's not the lens in which it sees the world. That's where security has to step in. Uh, so if we ha have that horror, they already have that list of damage scenarios of things that can possibly go wrong with this vehicle. Um, they maybe even have some threat scenarios that we can uh, reuse or maybe expand or tweak just a little bit to make it more security focused than safety focused. Um, but that's great because then we don't have to sit and come up with that out of thin air. We've got something to work from. So let's not do that work twice. Um, 
because it gives any kind of TARA that threat analysis and risk assessment, slight difference there, um, it gives that TARA process a head start, um, as well as uh, maybe some of the designs of the security controls. Because maybe a uh, safety control is, this is so critical to safety, we have to have a, a, a failover system. So if component A fails, it's got a backup right on the car to take in so that, you know, vehicles don't crash and kill people. So maybe that uh, controller is um, an engine controller, because if it's re if that controller is reset while the car is in motion, that's not um, things are going to go very, very badly if that if the engine controller is reset in motion. So from a hardware perspective, it could get reset from some uh, hardware component failing. Um, maybe it was too hot, there's a voltage spike, whatever. Um, that's those hazards um, that the horrors will focus on. Or uh, from the Tara perspective, it could get reset from a malicious actor trying to cause problems, intending to reset that controller in order to do some damage. Um, but here, this is why I say key point is to zoom out and look at the risk from the whole system. Security and safety have the same goal. Neither one of us wants uh, the engine controller to be reset while the vehicle's in motion. So uh, it would be great in order if we work together to achieve that goal. So, and of course, this isn't to say that regulations are bad and we should stop passing them because that is not the case. Um, we do need regulations um, eh, because in order to kind of force the organizations to do the right thing, instead of being so purely focused on profit, uh, Regulations have helped the environmental protections um, be a lot more, uh, a lot better. We've got some nice clean drinking water, um, some nice, mostly nice clean air to breathe um, because of the regulations on uh, environmental protections. But if we look at the cryptocurrency market where there's not a whole lot of regs, yeah, we can see the effect that having no regulation is uh, on that. So we do need to have regulations in order to hold the organizations accountable. Because uh, if we take a look at solar winds, they're not the DOD, they're not critical infrastructure, they're not telecom or healthcare or retail, those are the customers. So solar winds never uh, didn't fall under any of the regulations that were in place because they weren't any of those industries. They were they're just a tool to help manage IT network infrastructure. And clearly they did a good enough job with the tool and with their sales in order to build the customer list that they did. Um, and we can absolutely blame the customers to say, oh, they didn't do enough do due diligence on that third party uh, tool that they brought in. Um, we can have sympathy for solar winds because that was a, a nation state issue and nation states are probably going to get what nation states want because that's really hard to defend against. Um, and that because they had that vast uh, customer list, that became a very tempting target very quickly, I'm sure. Um, but we can also look at the market incentives um, that allow these organizations to uh, not spend money on security because it is more profitable not to spend money on security until it's not because they've experienced some kind of breach, some kind of major incident, and their stock tank, uh, their stock price tanks. Um, they have to pay out a bunch in identity uh, protection and monitoring for individuals. Um, they've got brand damage, they've got loss of consumer trust and all of those other things that are suddenly, it's not profitable not to spend on security. So uh, accepting the risk of doing nothing on the grounds that it's profitable isn't a great idea because it's not really working. Um, so regulations, they, they are important. Um, but it's going to be in the scope and in the audit powers that is going to be the trick here. Because if the scope's too narrow, we're going to go back to that divorce child problem of, oh, we're not this, we're this, so we don't have to uh, comply. If the scope is too broad, we're going to end up with something that's so so basic that, okay, yeah, it's some security, but it's not um, minimum enough to provide an adequate level of protection for the risk at hand. 
And then if we are going through an auditing, then we have to be really careful to not just turn it into a checklist of items. Because I've been on some of those audits and it kind of sucked. It was just check, 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 check. And I were we doing security for the network that uh, we were auditing? Maybe technically, um, but we were following the letter of the law without really following that uh, spirit of security. So we have to have well-trained auditors to cover the scope of that regulations. We have to actually give resources uh, to securities because if we continual, continually make exceptions for critical mission systems, we're already here. It's already not working. So here, here we are. Which is why I say we have an opportunity in disguise, because if we go back to our critical infrastructure area of transportation, um, the TSA has issued cybersecurity requirements for three out of six of the sub areas. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that 50% coverage does not include that highway and motor carrier. But that doesn't mean we're off the hook as a vehicle and automotive. Um, that just means that CIS is kind of triaging as fast as they can because transportation is just one of 16 different critical infrastructure areas. We also have uh, water and electric and uh, pipe, uh, pipeline systems. Um, so they're doing what they can in order to hit uh, the highest value target first, right? Because um, if we look at the areas that have had these requirements put in, uh, it's the areas that have had problems. So it's all already been the areas that have said, okay, uh, we had a major problem, so now we have to react and do something about that. And then the last thing on the slide here, the vehicle dealers I included, um, not that it's part of the critical infrastructure, but it's definitely part of our supply chain and vehicles because we have to have a way to sell our, sell our products. And that means that people are going to buy our products. Um, cars are not uh, not cheap, um, especially when you get into the big um, semi tractors. And it's actually the FTC that can go into those non banking financial institutions because they're doing money lending um, to help safeguard that consumer financial information. Um, so they're able to slip that in there and they're coming in for the mortgage lenders and the auto loan lenders and the payday loan lenders, they're trying to put in this uh, cybersecurity requirements that way. So, and that goes back to uh, my point earlier in the slide where if you're an organization and you just wanna do the right thing, uh, you don't necessarily know uh, who's covering you for regulation um, and what standards you do have to have in place. So that makes it very, very difficult to know. Um, and right now, it is good news that the lion's share of uh, the different uh, security areas are in the hands of the researchers, uh, not the attackers, not the malicious actors. But we can't expect that to continue indefinitely. So right now, we've got a, a really unique chance to put security in place before something catastrophic happens, which is, I know, absolute crazy talk, do something proactively in this economy. Um, because what's maddening is that if we actually go in and look at what the TSA has said for all of those sub areas, what they have to do is that they have to have an implementation plan. Um, and that implementation plan has to cover network segmentation and access control and patching and continuous monitoring and incident response. Um, they're requiring to have an assessment plan that tests and audits the uh, implementation plan. And then if we look at what the FTC is saying for the vehicle dealers, uh, it's very similar. Um, they, they also call out things like implement MFA, uh, manage your third party uh, providers, um, train some security personnel, make sure people know what's happening. And if all of that sounds familiar, that's because it is. So regulation overall may still be coming for uh, vehicles in non-EU nations, but we, we don't have to wait for that. We don't have to wait to see exactly what requirements are going to be included in a standard or a framework or a regulation. We don't have to wait to see if our organization is specifically covered or not um, 
And we also don't have to wait to decide what maybe some non-technical lawmakers think is important for our areas, because that's who's you know, passing these laws is the lawmakers. Um, we don't have to wait for all of that. And in fact, uh, we can't wait for all of that because if we look at the manufacturing process, it's a long lead time from that first initial design phase um, down the one side of the V up the other and then onto the production line. Um, so if we want to get ahead of the security, uh, uh, security that should be put in place for the vehicles, um, we have to proactively manage the risks. We have to start now so that when the lawmakers do get something through the current political landscape, um, we're already prepared um, that we because we didn't wait. So using tools like uh, audit scripts and threat modeling um, that can show how we meet uh, the standards and the frameworks that already exist rather than creating something brand new out of whole cloth just for ourselves. So we have a chance here and let's not waste it. And that is awesome. Thank right. you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Heather. That was great. I was really looking forward to that. Um, we are a little short on time, but we definitely have time uh, for a couple of, of, of questions and answers. So, uh, or as we like to call it, ask Heather anything. So, who wants to ask Heather something? <laughs> oh, looks okay. like we've got a question up on the screen now. We've heard about self-driving cars for consumer vehicles. Do you think self-driving will make its way into heavy trucking and transport industry? And if so, what growing pains and effects do you think that might have? Um, it's absolutely making its way into heavy trucking and transport because um, it's no secret that Packard is uh, uh, hiring for autonomous. Um, so we're definitely working on it. I'm sure all our competitors are working on it. So it's definitely coming because uh, we have a truck driver shortage because everybody's short staffed. Um, mm. And I think some growing pains will occur I'm going to say in the project management, because that's an area where the it, it may be treated by the business as a complete separate uh, project and initiative that's funded. Um, but when it comes to things like security and functional safety and all of those things, um, we already have teams in place. Um, so yes, it's going to be great to have a dedicated security uh, and safety team for that project but we also still have a, a team doing the rest of the business. So we really have to be able to work together and share and communicate. Oh. Ah, I think we had another one pop up there. There it is. Ah, wow. how do you think the threat and regulatory landscape might change as computers and online services become more integrated in cars and things like web and API hacking become more viable attacks on real world vehicles? I think the regulations are going to take a long while to uh, catch up, which is another reason why we can't wait for the regulations um, because it's happening now. And we already see that technology is pushing uh, forward at a faster pace than we can, uh, than we can regulate. Um, so I think it will eventually come, um, but we just have to keep pushing and keep uh, advocating for that to say, hey, you know, not that the sky is falling, we're not trying to like chicken little this, but this is an actual future concern that we need to start thinking about. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. So TLDR, the regulations are going to take some time to catch up. We should figure out other solutions in the meantime. Yes. And that way, when the regulations do come, we can be like, oh, look, we're already we're already doing all of this. We're already compliant. Uh, and you're on yeah. Discord in case anyone else has more questions. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you much. I